South Bay. How are you? You look good. I hope that goes past the skin. I hope that your heart's well. Well, I had planned on starting a series today called Himself. And it's really talking about the power, the power that Christ puts in you for you to live a victorious life. That you don't have to look outside of you. It's all inside of you when the Spirit of God lives in you and the Word is alive in you. But after the service last Sunday, um, I was, I was um, thinking and praying as I typically do. And, and the Spirit of the Lord just said to me, we're not done. Last week I talked to you about healing and, and there were people set free last week of great pain. Praise God. It was awesome. It was awesome. But on Sunday, I was like, Lord, is this, is, just, is this me? Is this you? And then Monday in my prayer time, the Lord just confirmed, I am not done. So we're going to spend several weeks looking at healing from a different direction. So today, I feel very confident that the Lord wants us to look at the concept of forgiveness. Would you say that with me? Forgiveness. And if you remember last week, I told you that pain, pain comes at us in three different venues, if you will, and only three. Number one is there are things that I do to hurt myself. There are things that, that this world does to hurt me, like if I'm walking down the street and a, and a tree falls over and, and lands on my toes, I'm hurt. And there's nobody to blame for that. That's simply something in nature. It's the, it's the fact that we're alive. So, so those are two. But the third I want to key in on this morning is are those times when when we are hurt at the hand of other people, when other people hurt us. You see, God does not want you to harbor unforgiveness in your life at all. And, and even, though, even though we may have unforgiveness, it's the heart of the Father that you wouldn't. Because when we walk in unforgiveness, it not only hurts us, but it hurts other people. And it actually hurts our relationship with the Lord. Listen to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Peter asks. And then Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. See, Jesus is conveying to Peter that as many times as he was sinned against, he ought to forgive. And, and what, I, what I see in that is it's not, it's not a situational. Forgiveness is not situational for you and me. It has to be a lifestyle, a lifestyle of forgiveness. I'm always ready to forgive. How in the world do we get to a place like that in our lives where I walk with enough stuff in me right now so that no matter what happens, I have the ability then to forgive? Well, see, the wisdom of this world and the teaching of this world can't possibly get a person to that place. The best we can do in this world is to be situational in our forgiveness, but that's really not even of the world because our world doesn't forgive. Our, furl, our world, uh, it, it pours out wrath and vengeance on individuals who have hurt us. It's never an easy thing to forgive, ever. As a matter of fact, I think if you and I were to sit down and, and we were to share or compare notes, we could probably come up with a pretty, pretty gnarly list of things that a person could go through, wouldn't you say? I mean, there's abuses, there's betrayals, there's character assassinations, there's physical wounds, gunshots and stabbings, there's, there's divorce abandonment. Our world is filled with deep, deep hurts that we walk with. Can you think of any in your own life? Instances that, that whether you did it to you, whether the world did it to you, or somebody else did it to you, and you've just walked with this hurt for so long, even maybe getting to the point where you're feeling as though I just going to carry this for the rest of my life and do the best that I can with this. It's too big. I, my, my arms don't reach down that far to pull this thing up by the roots. 
I'm powerless to, to bring about the healing that I want. You do realize that at some point in time in our lives, we have got to get to the place where we can take this pain. It's legitimate pain. It's real pain. It's real sorrow. And I'm not negating that at all. But somewhere along the way, we've got to take the pain and we've got to lay it at the foot of the cross somehow. Some way that has to happen. Otherwise, we, we walk in a, in, a, in, a, in a place of unforgiveness. And so much not good happens when we choose to walk in unforgiveness. See, in 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, Cast, casting all your anxiety, all your worry, all your fear, all your pain, cast it all on him, Jesus Because he, Jesus, he cares for you. Did you know that he's made a way for you to forgive? He's made an avenue for you. There certainly are implications, or we might call it consequences, of unforgiveness in our lives. Let me just share a few with you. And you might actually be struggling with some of these today, and you might not know why you struggle with certain things, but maybe today there'll be an aha for you going, oh my goodness, I didn't know that that happening in my life had anything to do with me walking in unforgiveness. Well, number one is we will end up putting walls up between us and the world. And you might say, well, isn't that what I'm supposed to do? Aren't I supposed to be separate from the world? But when Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and life abundantly, the abundantly is what I'm talking about. See, we live in a natural world, but we've been blessed of God. That's what the blood of the covenant is all about. You can have blessing today. You can have a healthy life today. You can have freedom today. But you see, when I walk in unforgiveness, I'm putting a wall up against the very blessings that God wants me to have while I'm here. Oh, there's so many more blessings when we get to heaven, but those aren't just reserved for heaven. God wants you to have blessing today. And the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ offers blessing to you. As a matter of fact, the New Testament tells us that we have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. But when I walk with unforgiveness, I have put a wall up between me and the blessings of the Lord. Not only that, but I will also end up mistrusting those around me who really are trustworthy. I will end up saying, I'm not going to get close to you. I'm not going to have an intimate relationship with you because you're going to do to me just what that other person did. So we cut off the opportunity for us to have rich and decent, godly relationships with people. We will lose friends. Friends that that God's placed in our lives to care for us. We don't let them close. Also, not forgiving will keep people from actually wanting to be around us. Do you realize that? They'll look at you, they sense bitterness, they sense resentment, and it's hard for them to connect and and plug in and and be a part because your heart's closed off. Listen to what Proverbs said, Proverbs 14 says, the heart knows its own bitterness and a stranger does not share its joy. These last two thoughts I have for you in regard to the implications of unforgiveness are very stout. And it is this. The first is that we are opening a door for the devil to begin to root out the good in our life and wreak havoc in our soul. Really, pastor, you're talking about the devil and unforgiveness? Really, I am. Listen to what Ephesians 4 says. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. What does it mean, a foothold? It means this. When I have unforgiveness, I've opened a door and the enemy then can come and he can plant bitterness, hatred, resentment, bigotry. All kinds of stuff can begin to take root in my soul. And it literally changes my mind about the people that I love. Changes my mind about God himself, which leads into the last one. And that is, and this is the most devastating of all. 
This is the implication that should scare us, and that is unforgiveness in my life will impact my relationship with God. I begin to look at him with cynical eyes. I begin to not trust him. And really what the passage in Matthew chapter 6 says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. This is a serious and significant issue in our lives. It's a, it's a choice issue. Do you choose to forgive or do you push back? You see, you might be thinking, well, it, it, pastor, if I forgive, I will never get back what I lost. Or if, if, if I forgive, then that person's never going to have to pay for what they did. And we rationalize these things, but all the while, those are just lies of the devil. Forgiveness frees you from the responsibility of actually even answering those questions. Forgiveness brings freedom. See, you can forgive. You can forgive, and here's why. You have been forgiven. You can forgive because you have been forgiven. This is a hard thing, especially when there's deep hurts So deep that even in your life today, even though this happened a long time ago to you, these these woeful pains that you're walking with, it's so significant that it continues to birth new feelings even today, even though this happened so long ago. Jesus can even forgive those things. Jesus has forgiven those things. And guess what? You can too. Listen to Romans chapter 5 verse number 8. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, maybe you're asking the question, how? How do I get there? How do I get to the place in my life where I can release this? The answer might surprise you. Last week, if you were here, I introduced to you a concept found in 2 Corinthians 7.10. Here's the verse. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Worldly sorrow leads to death. And we camped out a little bit in this, this concept of godly sorrow. Friend, I want to suggest to you that the key to forgiving others is feeling sorrow for what Jesus went through for you. So I want to slow down for just a moment now. And I want us to put our thinking caps on. I want us to, to investigate this, this phrase, godly sorrow. Because when I read that, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse number 10, what I'm understanding about that is that godly sorrow is an emotional response. Say the word emotional with me. Say emotional. It's not behavioral. Pastor, tell me what I need to do so that I can forgive. No, that's not what 2 Corinthians 7.10 says. Pastor, tell me, tell me what I need to think or tell me how I need to rationalize this. No, it's an emotional response. Godly thinking? Godly acting? No, what's the word? Godly sorrow. In this passage, are we, are we exhorted, are we pushed, are we, are we led to be aware of godly sorrow? Are we led to experience godly sorrow? See, there's a difference between those two. See, I, I can be aware of something and not experience it. Awareness and experience, two totally different things. Let me lead you to a passage in the Bible where this is painfully clear. In Matthew chapter 18, the story, you've heard the story, I'm sure, of the unmerciful servant. Yes? And and it's the story of the master who, who has this man who can't possibly pay his debt standing in front of him. And he's begging the master, would you release the debt? And it says in the passage that the master has pity on the servant and the servant is freed of all the debt 
that he has accrued over his lifetime, right? And then what does this merciless servant do? After having this debt lifted off of him, the first thing he does is he goes and finds somebody that owes him a couple bucks and he puts his hand around his neck and begins to shake him saying, pay me what you owe me. Here's my question. Was this man aware of the blessing he just received? Yes, he was. He left out of the presence of that master aware that his burden was lifted. But did did it go from his head to his heart? No, it didn't. You see, there's a difference between being aware of something and experiencing something. In Matthew 18, it says, And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of the fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, about $17, and seized him. And he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. You see, it wasn't in his heart. It was in his head. And my concern for you this morning is that you have the concept of forgiveness in your head. But you may not have ever seen it move down to captivate your heart. I want to take a little bit of time this morning to to teach us all what it means to not be aware of godly sorrow, but to actually experience godly sorrow together. So I want you, if it makes it easier for you, if you want to close your eyes, you can. If you want to just keep looking at me, that's fine too. But I want you to think with me. We're going to meditate on a passage of Scripture together. I want you to think about this. Imagine you're walking out on a walk one day, just enjoying the beautiful Florida Florida landscape and you come across this parcel of land and it draws your attention so you decide to walk out. And as you're walking out into this this almost a manicured beautiful area something catches your attention off in the distance not sure what it is nothing else is moving but this thing thing seems to be moving so you walk closer to identify what you think it might be and as you're walking closer you recognize that this is actually a person, a person. And and they're not standing up, otherwise that would be easy to recognize, but as you get closer, this person seems to be doubled over on the ground. Interested in that and why this person would be doing that out in this area, you walk a little bit closer, and as you get closer, you hear it, you hear it with your own ears. There's wailing and crying. Obviously, this person is distressed. This person is in agony. And this person has got some serious issues. Your heart, being who you are, you want to offer care. You want to comfort them. You want to find out maybe they're physically hurting. Something is going on. So the goodness of your heart, you want to go over and you want to minister to the person. Ask them, hey, are you okay? Is, are, do, do you need an ambulance? Is, is everything okay? Luke, Luke chapter 22, verse 41. And he, Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and he knelt down and prayed saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And it goes on to say, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In another passage, it says, Jesus said, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. So as you're standing there, you, you, you want to put your hand on this person's back and say, hey, it's going to be okay. Are, are you all right? I'll, I'm here. And it, just as about you're ready to put your hand on this person's back, you see that their clothes are drenched, wet. Even the ground around this person has soaked up 
sweat drops. You can see it. And it looks like the person is crying, but it's literally sweat, sweat dripping like a faucet. Right in front of this person, almost as though he is looking right down, there's a piece of paper. And you're wondering, what is that? Is that a divorce decree? Is that a, is that a, is that some kind of, of lawsuit? Is that, what, what is it? And, and you just glimpse at it quickly and you see it catches your surprise. It, it is actually every sin that you have ever committed written on a piece of paper. Every sin you've ever committed. The page is full. The corners are curled so you can see that there's writing on the other side. And then it dawns on you. This is Jesus. And the agony that he feels, the agony that his body is in is a result of what he's looking at on that piece of paper. It's my sin. It's my sin that's doing that to him. Friend, what do you feel right now? And listen to me, this is no place for guilt. This is no place for shame. This is a place for godly sorrow. Can, can your heart open just a little this morning and feel sad for him? The one who's bearing the weight of your sin? At that moment, he's shouldering your sin. He's taking it upon himself at that moment. That's the anguish. That's the agony. Would you stand with me for just a moment? Could you imagine for just a moment you getting down on your knees next to Jesus right there? And could you imagine your heart feeling sadness and brokenness for him? Could you even imagine saying to him, Jesus, Jesus, my heart is broken for what you bore for me. And Jesus, because you have borne my sin, I freely release whoever has hurt me in this life. Now, friends, does it make sense? Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. This morning, I invite you, between you and Jesus Christ this morning, I want you to imagine that Jesus is kneeling right down here. And right in front of, in front of him is a piece of paper, and that paper has every sin that you've ever committed. Would you join him this morning? Could you possibly enter into sorrow and brokenness at the weight of your sin? right now, would you come? Would you release the people who have hurt you and offended you this morning by joining Jesus and experiencing godly sorrow? Jesus, because you have done this for me, I release, and I want you to name the person. I release so-and-so in your name because you have done this for me. You come now. Would you kneel with Jesus Christ this morning? You come. You come. Amen. You come.
just kneel with Jesus this morning. You come. It could be a person. It could be a group of people. It could be yourself. There's no reason any longer to hold on to forgiveness because Jesus Christ forgave you. Because Jesus has forgiven me, I forgive you. Don't be the merciless servant. Be one who is set free by the love of Jesus Christ. You come. Kneel with Jesus this morning. Kneel with him. Kneel with him. Hebrews 12, 15 tells us, See to it that you do not miss the grace of God, which is forgiveness, which is Jesus shouldering your sin. See to it that you do not miss the grace of God. Lest a root of bitterness will spring up. It will trouble you and defile many. Don't miss the goodness of God as he has forgiven you everything. Now you are free to forgive everyone, everything. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have given to us freedom. I am not bound to unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. Lord, I don't have to be situational and worry what's coming next around the corner that's going to take me out at the knees. Because I have been forgiven, I am free to forgive any and all. May it be, Father, that not one person would leave this place this morning harboring unforgiveness with such a great truth as this that all they need to do is feel sorrow, godly sorrow. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen, amen. God bless you.